All right, awesome. We are live. Technology is amazing when it works. So for anyone who's listening right now, it's about 5.30 on uh, Thursday, March 19th. And I wanna say hi, everyone. Is everyone okay? Yeah. These are really strange times for sure. Um, I appreciate everyone being here on, in our Facebook group. Go ahead and share this so that we can get as many artists and creative business owners here to, to um, uh, enjoy this presentation and ask questions. This is an Embrace Creatives Creative Fuel Growth Series speaker event titled Protecting Your Art and Business. Uh, we have three more speaker events in 2020 that you can sign up for on Embrace Creatives, Telling Your Story, Retail Basics, and preparing for holiday sales. And they're spread out throughout the year. Right now, they're probably gonna be online, but obviously we're gonna see what happens with this coronavirus and whether we're all gonna be able to get together again in person. But if not, this is kind of a cool way to do it. Um, my name is Andrea Bogart, and I am a professional fine artist, business coach, and the founder of Embrace Creatives. EC is a caring business ecosystem that unites artists with commercial buyers. And we're igniting an empowerment movement for artists using targeted education like this, healthy connections like this, and sales opportunities. Our headquarters are in Metro Detroit, but our online community of close to 650 members is situated, is situated around the country. And we have global members as well. EC is free to join and soon we're gonna have a newly developed, redeveloped website that's going to allow our creative members to sell retail and wholesale to interior designers, architects, uh, retailers, galleries, and so forth. So look for our new website, but go ahead and join now because you're gonna automatically be put on our new website when it launches, hopefully mid-year. Embrace Creatives also offers in-person pop-up events throughout the year, as well as our platform where artists can upload their portfolios, get art calls and grants and connect with one another. It's really important to me that artists get together in person. And of course now we can't, so we're online. But our May Mix with the Maker is presented with the American Society of Interior Designers, Michigan chapter. We're gonna be bringing their members to Detroit to have an art and design like showcase with artists and designers. So artists and designers are gonna be there talking to interior designers, building those relationships in person and showcasing their art. If you'd like to apply to this, we'll be curating and jurying it. Go on to embracecreatives.com and apply. The deadline is uh, April 6th. So you can find information on the website. Um, again, I'm gonna tell everybody to hold their questions. You can write your questions in the comments until the end and then we'll open it up to questions that, that the speakers can answer. So we're gonna get started with our very special Protecting Your Art and Business Growth series events. I'm gonna introduce the special guest speakers. Um, the first is David Bogart. He is a serial entrepreneur, uh, also creative, um, but he is currently a, a commercial and insurance agent. He owns his own insurance agency. He does um, personal, property, auto, and commercial. And he's here obviously to talk about commercial insurance um, for artists and creative business owners. Mm -hmm. Damien um, Porcari, did I say that right? Yes, you did. Awesome. He's the director of the Elijah J. McCoy Midwest Regional United States Patent and Trademark Office. As the director of the, um, the Regional United States Patent and Trademark Office, Damien carries out the strategic direction of the Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the USPTO and leads the Midwest Regional Office in Detroit. From 1989 to 2017, Mr. Porcari worked for Ford Global Technologies LLC in Dearborn, Michigan, serving as its Director of Licensing and Enforcement from 2005 to 2017. Mr. Porcari is, named, is a named inventor on six U.S. patents and developed a widely used IP management software program. Welcome, Damien. Thank you so much. And welcome, David. Also, I forgot to welcome you. Um, Steve, and I love you to death, and I can never pronounce your last name. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Steve is... Steve, when I asked Steve for his t for what he, how he wanted to be yeah, I wish I had a written in a paragraph. Now I, he's like a I'll, digital I'll artist CV. from Nova. Just read my CV and that'll be fine. Seriously, <laughs> yeah, but that does not at all talk to say the enormous 
you know, brilliance of Steve. Like he's just, he's into so many things and he's going to talk about a lot of his experiences as a creative director and someone who does digital, digital art. And Thomas Grubba, um, also, so Steve and Dave are champions. They are the highest level of Embrace Creative members. They, and Thomas is as well. Thomas Gruba, they work with me on project development and moving the website forward. Thomas Gruba is an artist, photographer, educator, and therapist. And I welcome all of you tonight. Um, I'm really excited that you're here. The first thing I wanna do is, we're gonna start with Dave. So Dave, can you talk about, as, a, as someone who does insurance for um, a, for artists, you've done, uh, you've actually worked with some artists on Embrace Creatives and have insured their business. Can you talk about the risks that small business owners take and the type of insurance they can invest in to mitigate those risks? Well, artists are imaginative people. So just about anything you can imagine bad happening, can happen, of course, um, but you know some of the obvious ones are uh, someone's in your booth at an art fair and maybe your tent collapses and, and injures them. So that's a liability problem. You know, with windstorms and things like that, that can happen, obviously. Um, so that's a liability issue. Um, a property issue would be uh, your basement floods. If you've got a lot of your canvases down there or your materials and supplies, maybe there's a kiln down there or something and that gets damaged, so there's a property issue that you need to have covered. Um, some not so obvious ones, let's say you're you're uh, driving to the bank to make a deposit uh, for some artwork you sold, and you hit somebody on the way to the bank. Well, you've got your personal auto policy that might take care of that, but if the person that you hit finds out that you were on a business errand, they might try and sue your business as well. Mm -hmm. And you've seen all the advertisements on TV, there's lawsuits everywhere, there's lawyers willing to represent anybody for anything right now, so you have to be careful. Um, another not so obvious one that can happen is, uh, let's say you're at the Ann Arbor Art Fair and it's 120 degrees like it is sometimes there and somebody has a heart attack in your booth. Let's say you don't do anything. Well, they can sue you for not doing anything. Let's say you try and help them and do CPR, you do something wrong. Uh, that's called incidental malpractice. Well, a lot of our policies cover you for that too. So there's just all kinds of things that can go wrong. Um, Insurance can cover you for many of those things. It doesn't cover you for all of them, though. Uh, can, um, I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Dave, yeah. Uh, Dave I know that uh, I'm a, a photographer, artist, and I know that there's certain companies out there. I don't know if you cover it or not, but do you do general liability for, like, when you're on site, uh, you know, doing a photo shoot? I mean, for me, it's a photo shoot specifically, you know, but I have a... a uh, one million, five million policy that I carried for my photography business. Do you offer that to artists as well? If yeah, I mean, that's probably one of the most basic things we offer. Mm -hmm. um, and often I get calls on that because somebody is doing an art fair somewhere and they're required to have a general liability policy. Okay, so that would cover, even if you're on site with a commercial client on the job, that general liability would cover that as well? Yeah, when when we fill out the application, it you know we're asking for what are you doing so we have an understanding of it. Mm -hmm. you know, underwriters in the insurance industry. So I'm an agent and I deal with underwriters. And I try to explain them what I'm trying to insure for the client. Okay. So questions, you know, they're like detectives. They're like Matlock or something, these underwriters. Right. Because well, uh, one point I want to bring up is that I was on a job recently and I dropped my camera, right? And I had let my general uh, liability lapse because I wasn't doing enough work. Well, I had to eat the cost of that camera and that lens. So we also, I think, want to be thinking about other uh, resources that you have that might get damaged in the midst of doing the job that that, you know, is covered in the general liability. Right, right. Yeah, and that would be a, that's not a liability issue there. That's obviously, you know, your, your personal property. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, Joy, I see that you asked a question. We're going to hold the questions till the end. You can type your questions in and I'll try and go back or you can wait till the end and ask. But I think um, if you have questions as we go through, maybe jot them down because um, we're probably going to hold off to the end and then, I don't know. What do you think? What do you think, gentlemen? Should I get questions as we go or hold off? I think ask them as you go. I, I find that more fluid and um, okay. Okay. me. So we're going to do that. All right. So do me a favor, everyone. Um, write your name 
before your question, because I'm seeing it on, on the screen that you're looking at, um, the, the software screen, not on Facebook, and I need to know who everybody is. So Joy asked, what do you think about a ACT Insurance, AC ACT? Many uh, shows suggest this company. Do you know anything about, does anyone know anything about ACT Insurance? I don't. Is that uh, specific to artists? Sound, sounds like it. It's almost specific to art fairs uh, in general. And because the unlike a liability or, you know, the other ones are talking about, which are generally year long policies, you could buy the act insurance for just a month or just two months. Um, so it generally is the company that you go to and it's geared specifically. So it's relatively inexpensive. It doesn't have a lot of the other coverage that insurance does. It's specifically geared for the art fair itself. Um, now I never had a claim that I had to put through them, so I don't know what the response time is or anything like that, but it was like 12 bucks for me to get for the art fair. Um, I knew I was covered and then I didn't have to commit to a year long policy and all of that, you know, uh, sort of stuff. So if you're just doing art fairs, it might be worth it, but if you're doing other stuff in general, it'll probably be just as well to go the route with Dave, uh, rather than doing that. Yeah, and just to give you an idea, for instance, I have a client, um, he's a, an executive at General Motors, but he makes these uh, artistic lamps out of uh, car parts. And he needed a, just a general liability policy because he does different art fairs and things like that. Uh, that policy was $150 a year. Mm -hmm. and that's liability only. It does not cover any of his inventory or equipment or anything like that. Okay. But the fairs that he was doing required him to have a liability policy in case right. somebody gets hurt while they're visiting his, his booth at an art fair. Right. Um, Diane said that, uh, this is more of a comment, this is about insurance. I pur purchased art insurance for several years and when I had an incident, they were very difficult uh, to get compensation from and eventually they sent me packing. Also, it was very expensive. She wants you, Dave, to provide your website with prices to artists at a later date. So if you want, Dave, um, you can put your information in the comment section, but to let everybody know, because I may not have mentioned, I am videotaping this. Uh, let me check to make sure. Yeah, I'm still videotaping this. And um, I will be putting it up on the Embrace Creatives uh, website later at some point. I've got to edit it. Um, and then I'm going to put everybody's information in that um, so you can reach out to them and any resources that they that they provide. Um, Michelle yeah, Sider, thank you, Michelle, oh, for saying I was, gonna, I was going to address her issue, too. Oh, go ahead. And, and, you know, as Andrea said, I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur. I've owned a number of different businesses over you know, 25 years. And um, as a consumer of insurance, like a lot of people, I was, you know, before I was in the business, I was unsure of what my coverage provided. And a lot of people are unsure of that. So sometimes mm -hmm. you think something's covered, but it's not, you know, in a, an insurance policy can be that thick. It can be 40 or 50 pages of what's included, what's not included. So... Um, that's why it's important, I think, to deal with a good agent, too, that can explain everything, make sure that, that the client understands what they're covered for, what they're not covered for, because it can be real disappointing mm -hmm. if you file a claim and you realize you had no coverage for that whatsoever. So. Right. Yeah. Good point. And I'm not being biased at all when I say David is a very good agent. He's very caring. I cry. <laughs> well, okay. David is a very good agent, and I'm not married to him, so you can trust me. <laughs> we can trust you. Andy's hot. Yes. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I will agree. Mich Michelle Sider asks, um, and Michelle Sider is, um, now these are all fine artists. I know Michelle uh, works with mosaics, um, with tile. If I'm teaching a class at someone else's studio or at a gallery, do I need to have insurance to cover an incident that may come up? What about teaching classes at my home art studio? Well, if you have a, a general liability policy and if it's written right, usually it'll follow you around wherever you go yeah. you know, within certain limits. Mm -hmm. um, so she probably shouldn't. It probably would not be very expensive. It's, it's not like it's a, a real hazardous thing that she's doing. So mm -hmm. that would be a good idea. Yeah. So, it, yeah. so if, if someone bought that general liability, it would go, it would stay in their place and it would follow them to other locations where they are teaching or showing their art or whatever it is that they're doing. Right. As right. long as the you know the application was filled out properly, that indicates what their activities are. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think that's a really, really important when you sit down with an insurance agent to know 
where where do you go? What do you do? They're going to have to ask you all. And they should be asking you those important questions. They need to know your business really well so they understand how to insure you. They need to know what you do as an artist, what you do as an arts professional, because it's not just showing your work. It's also like Michelle and other Embrace Creative artists, they teach. They teach art classes at other locations or they may have their own studio um, where they, they also teach or they have teachers that, that come in. So uh, a good insurance agent really is going to ask you a lot of very important questions about, about your business. Yeah. And I, I think if you're teaching in your studio too, I mean, there's sort of two concerns. What if someone bumps into an artwork that you have, knocks it off the wall and trashes it? And secondly, what if someone just slips and falls and they're, they're at your place? You know, that could be really hazardous if you don't have insurance for that. Teaching, you know, out in somewhere else, I wouldn't be so concerned about. But if you're bringing people in your studio, you know, again, and Dave said it's for the worst case scenario, it's better to have that coverage. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh, this is interesting. I think this may have come from Diane. Let me just check. Uh, yeah, Diane said... Um, I look forward to the website, Dave, info, uh, and info regarding this topic. She understood the policy and what was covered. And this is something, Dave, you and I talked about earlier. The problem was that they questioned the value mm -hmm. of her art. You want to talk about that a little bit? Because that is something that's really difficult for artists to, it's hard for us to ensure our art because it's difficult for us to provide value. Right. And I, I try to dig into this a little bit more because, uh, so I'm with Farm Bureau Insurance. So we're a Michigan-based insurance company. And um, for instance, we do not cover the, the selling value of your, your product. So if you're doing a fair okay. and you've got $5,000, that's the retail price of, of say 10 pieces in your booth and a tornado comes along, destroys everything, we cannot reimburse you for that. Okay. Um, we have a brokerage part of our business that could probably find someone to ensure the, the selling value of that. Uh, but I wasn't able to get any information on that prior to this um, this video conference here. So, um, but that's that's very hard to insure for that. We would insure for the materials that went into it, you know, the cost of the canvas and the paint and everything like that. But we cannot insure for the retail value of it. But and also, most insurance companies will not take the word of the artist. They're going to need proof. They're going to need sales. So. Um, previous sales, what has your art sold for? Can you provide those sales receipts and also possibly an appraiser? They're not yeah. just gonna say, sure, Diane, we, we trust you, your work is $10,000 a painting. I mean, they, they're gonna need proof, just like anything else. If you have a loss, they wanna see the receipts, you know, how much you spent on that or now how much it's worth. Right, and it's like any kind of an art collector too. If we're insuring something that's worth more than say $1,000, we need an appraisal on that usually an appraisal is less than five years old. Um, and I found uh, in the insurance industry, just with claims I've dealt with, the more documentation you have on anything, the better right. it is. Right. The writers and the claims, <clears throat> they need to see whatever you have, any pictures, any kind of documentation, receipts, everything, the more you have, the better it is to, to um, get the claim yeah. less of the way you want it to be. Can I, can I second on that too? Because this dovetails into copyright, you know, which we're going to get into as well. Like if your copyright is infringed, you need to have documentation or have some sort of source that can actually verify the damages that you're charging for, for the usage of that or the improper usage of that. So you're going to need to like be able to document all of this. Just another, you know, reason for why, even if it's years old, you know, keeping all sales receipts, all, you know, and I know that us artists can be really kind of flaky with that sort of stuff. But if we want to receive compensation, especially with copyright, there's a lot more involved in it, market value where it's being used, et cetera, et cetera. But we need to have that documentation so we can start to back up the claim that we're making because you can, just can't go to the copyright office and say, oh, it was twenty thousand dollars that I would have been paid for that. They're going to like prove it. I want to know that you can prove this. Um, so just to reiterate all of these, you know, not just for your own business purposes, it's really important to keep track of all that sort of stuff. So.